voice today on the show. First time, Steve Rothery, guitarist I'll- extraordinaire of Marillion. How's that? Yeah, well, yes, it's a, it's a good uh, intro. <laughs> Talk to Mark Kelly. I've talked to Steve Agarth in the past, but I finally get you on the show. Very excited. Uh, a Cheers. co-founder from the early days. Yes, 44 years this year since I joined the band. Wow, wow, time flies. Just to give everybody a quick update, Marillion Weekend in Italia, April 28th to 29th. Montreal, that's where I'm at, May 12th to 14th. UK 27 to 28th of May. And Berlin, Germany, 23rd to 24th. And I guess my first question to you is, since we're kind of pushing the Montreal angle a little bit, and we'll have a little bit of trivia for everybody. Let's see what's how Steve does on the Montreal trivia questions. I'll, I'll toss them in between questions, okay? First question is, what is this relationship that Merlion has had with Montreal? Uh, tell me about the relationship Merlion has had with Montreal over the years. Uh well, it goes way back to the first time we played there back, I think, in 1984, mm-hmm. uh, the Spectrum. Um, it's always been an amazing audience. It's always been the highlight of, of any tour of, of the States and Canada, really. Um, incredible. I mean, the, the first live album we recorded, part of that was recorded at the Spectrum, um, Real to Real, back in 84. Um yeah, just magical. I mean, we've had so many fantastic shows in Montreal over the years. Was it anything specific that triggered the following in Montreal? Do you remember? Was it the radio play? Was it just the push? Why more so in Montreal than, than let's say, Toronto, as an example? Um, I just think maybe the tastes are a little bit more European, maybe. Um there just seems to be more of a basic understanding of what the band stood for. Uh, and, and a passion for, for what we did. I mean, Toronto was always good as well, but not to the same degree. Uh, there seems to be something uh, at uh, Montreal audience seemed to take us to their hearts. Absolutely. I remember those days. Um, yeah. I remember there was a lot of radio play, especially on Real to Real and just the first album. So we were talking to uh, Kingdom Come, the band that sort of had that Led Zeppelin vibe in 84, 85, around there. They got popular. They were always looking for the next Led Zeppelin when Led Zeppelin sort of dem- yeah. sort of stopped in 80. So there was like this demand. Do you think that since you were a co-founder back in the early days, Peter Gabriel's out of the picture, there was a there was a demand for that sound. I'm not saying you guys sounded like them exactly, but of some sort of mystique, romantic, prog. I think there's always going to be a certain sort of person who's looking for something that's just a little bit more interesting than straight ahead rock. Uh, and I think that's true for every generation. <clears throat> and I think, you know, we came through the tail end of the whole punk new wave movement. Um, and in a way that did kind of change something in terms of how we presented ourselves. I think there's an energy and an attitude, uh, even going way back to the early days that, uh, you could tell that we'd been through that. It's you know, it's it's about as far from ELP's Love Island, for example, as you could get. Um, you know, so we we had the those influences of those early se- and mid seventies bands and those classic albums, but also get you know, a channel through this maybe additional energy. You know, you look at Fisher's lyrics on the first album, things like He Knows, you know. And Forgotten Sons, you know, there's a lot of anger there that you wouldn't really get on most, if you want to call them pure prog records, you know. Um, so I think there was, yeah, there was something that set us apart. And I think every every generation wants to find and discover something new. Uh, and, you, you know, we had quite a young audience in, in those early days. Maybe, you know, maybe their elder brothers were kind of into heavier music or whatever and, People discovered their own thing and 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 uh, and followed us devotedly since those days. And I will say that you know I got the uh, the 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 Lux box sets here. Here they are. Can you see that? Yeah. And I want to tell everybody out there these are beautiful and the sound quality is just phenomenal. You know, it's just it's a beautiful sort of a record of this era. You know. I've got yeah, the Fugazi one too, and I, I'm waiting for Holidays in Eden and uh, Season's End, which is going to be coming. Yeah, no, it's like the ultimate versions of those records, really, which I think um, 
Yeah, it's a really worthwhile thing. If that's a, if the, what's the one you're going to lead people with, then uh, do you yeah. guys do you guys own the masters of these? Is it or is it just strictly the record company? Uh, it's it's a record company, but you know we we um, cooperate with them in, in terms of producing the extra content, uh, and you know we've got, we've got a halfway decent deal. Um, nothing compared to you know the later albums that we we own, but. Uh, just the nature of the beast, really. When dealing with majors, and you know, you sign a deal in those in those days uh, in perpetuity. So, yeah, you know, they own it, and it's a <laughs> perpetuity is the word. <laughs> yeah, so you just gotta, you, you make the best of that situation. All right, so let's let's jump to some trivia. You ready? Yeah. Since you're coming to Montreal, I might as well throw out some Montreal trivia, right? You may know, you may or may not know. Don't feel bad. Don't feel bad at all. Maybe you know all that. All right. What is the name of the mountain in the center of Montreal? I will give you two choices. I will give you two choices. Mont Royal or Mount Everest? Uh, I think Mont Royal would probably be the one. Ding, ding, ding. You're doing good. Did you know that? Did you know that answer before? Uh, no, I didn't. I mean, I was spent a long, a long time in, in in Montreal over the years, with the especially with the different weekends. So I've seen a fair amount of the city, but uh, but not that. So now you know there's a mountain right in the middle of Montreal. It's called Montreal. That's where they derive the name Montreal. Okay. Okay. Oh, got you right. Yeah. Now here's an easy one. I'm going to throw a couple easy ones at you. Celine Dion is from the Greater Montreal. True or false? I know she's Canadian, so I'll say yes. Ding, ding, ding. You got it right. <laughs> That's two out of two. Great stuff. The last question for now. Is Montreal an island, true or false? True? You got it. True it is. Montreal is an island. Not in the Caribbean sense, but sort of it is an island that, that you have to. by wolves. Yeah, you need to get on some bridges to uh, go onto the island. So yes, the greater, the sort of central Montreal is an island. All right, just going to talk quickly about the new album. Here it is. You know, I, I know you played it last time when you came into Montreal. I'm not sure if you could give away any spoilers. Um, are you going to be playing a big part of the the album, you know, um, this time around? I mean, are yes. you going to do the same thing, more or less? Um, well, it will be a very different set, but we will include the new album. Uh, I mean, it, it, people are absolutely loving it. Uh, it gets such a strong response from uh, from the fan base. And the Montreal weekend is the only other three-day event apart from the first one in Port Zealand. All the rest of these weekends are just two-day events. That's so, true. Um, yeah, so it's going to be very special. An hour before it's dark, pick it up. I think it's probably one of my favorite Marillion albums as it stands today. I, I just there's something uh, organic and there's something memorable, and I think it's more melodic this time around. It's a lot more melodic. Yeah, it's it's just amazing, really. It's it's like I says how it it came together, and you know, Mike Hunter, the producer, has to take a lot of credit for having the vision. Uh, but then when you you had all these um, different elements in, like, the choir, um, yeah. and, you know, it kind of raises the music up a different level. I mean, I, I did my guitar solo at the end of Crown Nightingale before the choirs had been added. So then to to hear the final mix with those as well, it, it's, it's uh, quite emotional, really. It is, especially... Uh post covid when you listen to it the lyrics really resonate with the, sort of the losses that happen and the confusion no and definitely know that that's a subconscious theme that's running throughout right yeah and especially with the track care really um it's uh it's an album that could only have been made by living through the pandemic really uh and i think it's uh it, I, i'm very proud of it i think it's quite a remarkable album and uh the difficulty is going to be trying to follow it with the next one. That is always the case. <laughs> yes, always. <laughs> All right. Um, tell me about, so Montreal is the only official three-day weekend. What can fans expect? You know, say somebody wants to go to this weekend. What can they expect if you had to just sort of like to pitch them in 30 seconds? Yeah, uh, well, it's yeah, like I say, it's a second three-day event after the, the the first original one in Port Zealand. But it's 
It's a full-on Marin experience, really. I mean, we have the best audience in the world, um, so there is a, a passion and the excitement for the music. Um, I think is very, very rare these days. Um, you know, it's a great live band, great light show, and uh, it's a party, really, for people who who like good music. Are there sort of like afternoon events? I remember last year there was like a book signing during the day. I think it was Mark Kelly who was signing. Little, yeah. Are there little sort of events that are going out on throughout the day or not? Uh, I don't know, actually. I haven't, I haven't seen the timetable. Um, I mean, there's normally like unofficial things that are happening like down at the Brutopia pub. Um, so I'm sure there'll be some things that are, that are happening, but I haven't, I haven't actually had the the timetable let's get lucy on the horn we'll get (laughs) all right uh just quickly i'm going to be jumping back and forth throughout time Uh, uh, as a big merlion fan growing up big iron maiden fan growing up rod smallwood was your i guess your official or non-official consultant in the u.s back in the day tell me about that relationship and and I'll tell you where I'm going with this because there's a lot of metalheads who are Marillion fans and a lot of, you know, prog fans who are metalhead fans. So it's, you know, it's. Yeah, absolutely. Delicious. I mean, I think people um, can enjoy a wide spectrum of music. Um, yeah, Rod. Rod's uh, a real character. Uh, he. Yeah, John Arneson brought him on, along as like a consultant manager in that time in the. Uh, 80s when we we're trying to break america um kind of known him since those days i mean there was a period after we uh left john arneson and hit and run management where uh sanctuary managers for for a, a year or two um and uh yeah he's he's one of a kind <laughs> was you. was the whole sort of marketing of of rod Guys, let's also get in Kerrang. Let's also appeal to those hard rockers, metal heads at the time, um, the imagery. No, that, you know. Yeah, no, that just came about quite naturally. I think we, we were maybe partly because of the logo was so distinctive on on, on the, the first records. Um, you know, you'd see people with their denim jackets or their leather jackets with the logo written or or painted on. <clears throat> I think so there's a very strong identity uh, and it's you know that's a, wanting your own thing, wanting the uh, your own new band for your generation. Um, but then you know we had um, tracks like Kaylee and Lavender in the top of the heavy metal charts, which obviously <laughs> is about as far from heavy metal as you could get. But it was just like it was rock fans, really. I would say more than heavy metal fans, just people who who like to hear guitars, who like music with a bit of attitude. <laughs> and uh yeah i think there was there was quite a crossover um especially in the fish years um with that kind of audience tell me about uh, mick pointer uh and his sort of his stay and what, what was and again you know i i followed arena as well and i know you even guessed it on arena uh, yeah. i believe it was a guitar solo on one of the tracks i mean is the relationship still is, is it still strong today or is it you guys are amicable or um yeah i saw mick for the first time when when we're doing the uh filming for the documentary to go along with the the uh, script for justice tier uh Rishi. i saw him very briefly it's the first time i have seen him in i don't know 10 or 15 years um so there's not really a kind of relationship there uh, as such. Um, you know, it was Mick and the original uh, bass player, um, Doug Irvin, who who was, was Marillion or still Marillion in those days when I auditioned and joined back in 1979. Uh, and, yeah, I always got on really well with Mick. Yeah, it's just parts of his personality that could be a little bit prickly. Um <laughs> But uh, when Fish joined, it was it was a bit of a clash of egos between the two of them, really, where they both thought of, thought of the band as being their band, and uh, uh, of course they were wrong. It was my band, uh, but <laughs> uh, it was just one of those things, you know. Mick, I think, was a little complacent. Um, uh, he he wasn't the most natural drummer in the world. Um, 
you know, it had a certain flair, but it, but he wasn't a very technical player. And we came up against quite a lot of limitations recording the first album script for Just As Tear. Uh, and then, like, this personality conflict um, between him and, and, and Fish got to that point where, you know, there had to be a change, really. Is it true you wrote most of the music on the first few albums? Who? Mick? You. you, you oh, you, me. You, yeah, I was going to say, yeah. yeah. Um, Not Mick, you. Yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, the there's parts of script um, that I wrote more of uh, sections, big sections of like in, in the, the web of Forgotten Sons, uh, parts of script itself, um, quite a lot of Chelsea Monday, I suppose. Um, yeah, during the fish years, I probably wrote about eighty to eighty-five percent of the music, at least the initial ideas. You know, you then you arrange them. Every everyone does their thing, and them both. Um, Peyton and Mark are brilliant at uh, coming up with parts, but the basic structures or the chord changes or the, you know, some of the most important parts uh, I, I came up with. Um, that changed slightly when when um, C. Fogarth joined, with more of a sort of like a, a mixture these days, where yes, you know, some certain people will, will write certain sections, uh, or, or somebody will write a section and then we kind of develop it. Um, but yeah, it it's it's earlier, but one of the few things I'm really good at. <laughs> I mean, it must have been somewhat of a relief when Steve Hogarth joined. Okay, now all the pressure's not on you, but now you can also flesh out ideas that he has started with. Yeah, absolutely. When we we first started playing the um Easter idea, I mean it was just the first part of the song. Uh, without the guitar solo and um the guitar part was actually what the, what the keyboards played on the record so I, I i kind of brought my own interpretation to that and then the solo section was something that i improvised that we just happened to record and that i could go back and relearn and uh we could incorporate um so yeah it's it was a great and it is a great musical chemistry. You know, you've got five very creative people in the band. Sometimes you have more music than you can use, which is a, <laughs> it's a good problem to have. It's a good problem to have. All right, back to trivia. You ready? Definitely. <laughs> Frank Marino of Mahogany Rush is from Montreal. True or false? Uh, true. Yep. Frank Marino is from Montreal and he still lives here. So, right, I did, I did have a Frank. Mahogany Rush. I had a Mahogany Rush album actually yeah. <clears throat> on vinyl. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Is Getty Lee from Rush originally from Montreal? True or false? False. You got it. You're doing great so far. Look at this. Hey. <clears throat> Was April Wine formed in Montreal? True or false? Oh, I wouldn't know. Uh, true. <sighs> Nope, it's it, it's somewhat true. It's actually they formed in Halifax on the East Coast, but then came to Montreal to sort of break the band. Oh, well. I'm not sure if you're an April Wine fan or not. No, not really. Okay, all right. But here we go. Who was not a Montrealer? Who was not a Montrealer? Leonard Cohen, Oscar Peterson, or Alanis Morissette? Not... I'll say it again. Leonard Cohen, Oscar Peterson, the jazz pianist, or Alanis Morissette. Mm. Tricky one, huh? I'm going to get it wrong anyway, but I say Alanis Morissette. You got it right. Ah. Leonard Cohen, yep, grew up in Montreal, was raised in Montreal, recorded in Montreal, and of course he went off to greater pastures, passed away. Oscar Peterson from Montreal, from immigrant parents, and he even has like a um, an auditorium named after him in in you know a, in a university in Montreal here. Right, I remember he used to have a, a TV show in the UK, uh, and I remember yeah Keith Emerson appearing on it. Oh. Yeah. All right. Tell me about uh, Steve Hackett now. Steve Hackett, you're going to do some shows. That's pretty exciting. Uh, yeah. Well, Steve and I have been working um, on a project together for quite a long time now, uh, which I've 
tried to move forward recently. We had another session uh, a few months ago uh, based on some music we did together sort of six years ago uh, on the previous writing session. And I kind of, with my keyboard player from my solo band, Ricardo Romano, um, mm -hmm. did quite a lot of arranging of these ideas. And uh, yeah, I think we've, we've got the, uh, the basis of a quite an interesting album. Are you going to play some shows together as well? It really depends. I mean, he's so incredibly busy, and and my timetable with Marillion keeps keeps me pretty busy. I mean, I sneak in some solo shows um, occasionally. I've, I've got a few throughout Europe uh, in June and September, October this year. Um, but generally speaking, yeah, Marillion is a pretty much a full time. I'm in the middle of making three different projects at the moment outside of Marillion this mm -hmm. album with uh, Steve Hackett, my Revan to a space themed instrumental album and an album with Thorsten uh, questioning from Tangerine Dream so uh, I'm keeping busy Okay, let's go back to trivia French fries with gravy and curd cheese is called Putin or Putin Oh yeah, this could go very very wrong <laughs> Uh, Putin or Putin? Putin. You got it, my friend. It's a good. It's a good choice. It's a good answer. Yeah. Is Montreal best known for Philly steaks, Philly cheese steaks, or bagels? Um, well, I don't think I've had either there, so that's a really difficult question. Um, Steve, 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 Steve. You haven't had a Montreal bagel? No. There's a hint right there. Oh, well, I think it's going to be bagels. Isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> so Montreal is known for its bagels. So when you come to Montreal, make sure to pick up some bagels. Will do. They're iconic. If you like bagels. Maybe you don't like yeah, bagels. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. No, uh, love, love uh, bagels. Yeah, I'll be there for a week. So uh, I'll make sure I will try one out. All right. Is Montreal best known for smoke meat or smoked meat? Is Montreal best known for smoke meat or smoked meat? Smoked meat. You got it, my friend. Everybody gets that wrong even in Montreal. People say smoke meat. It's not smoke meat. It's smoked. That's the proper yeah. English. That's why I have an Englishman on. Yeah. <laughs> Here's one more. Here's the last one. True or false, the Montreal flag... The official flag of Montreal represents the English, the French, the Aboriginals, the Scottish, and the Irish as the sort of founders of the city who built the city up. True or false? False. True. True. What? The Montreal flag has the English. Uh, what's the symbol? The uh, English. Union Jack. Yes. No, not the Union Jack. Not the Union Jack. That's the British. The, oh, the... Uh, England, England. Right, right. The the shield. The flower. The, the rose. Right. The rose. The rose. The rose. See, I even forgot. The French fleur-de-lis. The right. a, a, Aboriginal... Uh, I think it's a it's like a pine tree. The Scottish. And, of course, the Irish with their four-leaf clover. So wow. that's Those are yeah. the, the pictures on the Montreal flag. So when you pass by Montreal, you take a look at the flag, you'll say, wow, I didn't know that. That's pretty cool. Yeah, yeah. I will check that out when we, when we land next time. Yeah, <laughs> that's right, right. All right, let's get back to it. Um, what about music for a new album? Are you guys, are you, are you just tossing ideas around, or thinking about well, it? Yeah, you, you know, it's a very different state of mind when you, when you, uh, turn your focus to writing. So at the moment, we're just in performing mode. You know, it's like to do these Marillion weekends, you have to keep between six and seven hours of music in, in your head. Um, it doesn't leave much space to come up with new things. Uh, having said that, I mean, there were some ideas from the last album that we didn't use uh, that we might well revisit. There's one complete song uh, that was great but just wasn't didn't fit in with with the rest of the stuff for the for the record so um we're probably going to be spending most of uh 2024 writing and then probably start recording towards the end of it hopefully for a release in 2025 but you know when you when you spend six to eight months of the year rehearsing and then playing these weekends around the world. It it doesn't leave much time to do anything else. Yeah. All right. 
name me your favorite solo in the Fish era and your favorite solo in the Steve Hogarth era. Uh, oh, in the Fish era, probably uh, Incubus. Cause that's the first solo I found. Mm. Felt like I really kind of defined what it was I wanted to do on the guitar. Um, and that's so many solos with the, the H era, but um, probably the, the last solo in this strange engine. Uh, always oh, yeah. an amazing response. Yeah. What about name your favorite album in the Fish era and your name your favorite album in the Steve Hogarth era, which is probably a little more difficult because there's a lot more albums there. I get that. Yeah, Fish Era, I'd say probably clutching at straws. Um, so the Steve Hogarth era is almost impossible. Um, <laughs> uh, but I'd say probably Afraid of Sunlight. I think it's a great collection of very different songs. Yeah, I would agree with you too. I mean, I, I would say that Afraid of Sunlight and this album are like on par with each other. Yeah, uh, no, I, I, I kind of go along with that. And it got had that same vibe. Is there anything you want to say about the upcoming shows that I didn't actually ask you? Um, no, not really. I think I would just look really looking forward to it. It's always such a pleasure to visit uh, Montreal and, and try and explore the city and, uh, you know, do what you can. You get over the jet lag as soon as possible so you can uh, go off exploring. Okay. So you now you know about the bagels, you know about yeah. the smoked meat, you yeah. know about the flag. You know yeah. about who came from here as musicians. Now you're going to look for all these little things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's always, it's a it's a real pleasure to walk around. You know, there's loads there's loads of uh, interesting paths that I find to the city, not just the old part, but uh, you know some of the other places. I can't even remember the the names of them because my my daughter uh, took us around a few places. But uh, yeah, really really interesting. All right. And on that note, Steve, thank you so much. Look forward to seeing you guys in Montreal, watching the shows. Uh, much appreciated. Thank you for your time. Yeah, good to speak to you.